Okay, we're back here live at the IBM IOD Information on Demand Conference, hashtag IBM IOD. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE, and Wikibon's flagship program. We go out to the events, <laughs> extract a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dave Vellante, and we'd love to have analysts in here, uh, and in this case, former analyst, uh, James Kovilas, welcome to back to theCUBE. Thank you very much, John. Thank Appreciate you, Dave. It. Pleasure to be with you again. Thanks you're for a, being at IOD. Oh. You're a thought leader. You are an influencer. You work at IBM. So you, you, you're out there in the front lines doing some great work. So uh, Thank you very much. Tell us, explain to the folks out there, not about the show, because we've had some people commenting, obviously you're, you work for IBM, but where does this fit, where does this vector in context to what's relevant in the market? Obviously big data and analytics uh, is the hottest thing on the planet right now, mm -hmm. and you got social business now emerging categorically here, but it has a couple different flavors to it, right, within IBM's context. Yeah. But the messaging is simple, right? You got analytics that drives value, outcomes, social business is the preferred way of people are gonna operate their businesses. Yeah, engagement and all that. Yeah, yeah, it's great stuff. New channels, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, explain to them how IOD is fitting into these mega trends. Into mega trends. The, mega, the hottest trends. Why are customers caring about what's going on here? There's a lot of vibe, a lot of act activity around customers. What is, how, where does IOD fit into that whole bigger picture? Yeah. Well, you know, the world has changed. The world culture has changed uh, radically and really in the last decade or so, and it's everywhere in the world. Everything is now online and digital. Increasingly, it's streaming in terms of culture. Look what's happening to Hollywood. It's being deconstructed by the Netflixes of the world. You know, movies and TV and music, and everything is delivered online now. All engagement, more and more engagements with your employer, with your, you know, with merchants with your family everywhere is online, things like streaming media. So if you look at how the world culture has changed, I, um, well yesterday uh, I spoke here on a topic that's near and dear to my heart called big media. It's the, the, the ascendance of streaming media in not just the areas I laid out, but in education, like MOOCs, distance learning. We use it internally at IBM for our Think Fridays, you know, Ginny Rometty and the executive team, you know, every Friday it's uh, cloud or it's big data or whatever, you know, we need, all need to get up to speed on. The world culture has changed. Now, analytics is fundamental to that whole proposition in terms of world culture. Analytics drive engagement. Analytics in terms of, you know, in a business context, analytics a 360 degree view, and you have data warehouses and the master data, and you have predictive models to drive segmentation and target marketing and all that good stuff. You know, that's been in business uh, for a long time, that those set of practices, they have become prevalent in most industries now, not just in, say, uh, retailing, you know, the Amazons of the world. They're pervasive across all industries. Big data is fundamental to the, that, you know, engagement model, and it's social. Social in the sense that Social is one of many channels through which businesses engage and with, through which pe many people engage. But social is assume, assuming a degree of importance in the fabric of modern life that goes beyond simple you know, engagement with uh, you know, brands and whatnot. Social is how people create. It's how they declare who they are. It's their identity. And so social in your personal life, we all know about Facebook and Twitter and everything else and YouTube. But social has revolutionized enterprise cultures everywhere. You know, we use social internally, of course, we use our own Lotus Connection. Most large and even many mid-sized mid firms now use social for interactions among employees or throughout their value chain. So social business is about all of that. It's the B2C, it's the B2B, it's the E to E and employee to employee. All these different models of engagement, they all demand a number of things. Obviously the social platform. They demand the data of various sorts, structured and unstructured, in shared repositories or cubes or marts or whatnot. They, it demands the, the big data platforms, not only at rest but in, in motion, the streaming media, to make it all happen in real time. So at IOD, if you see what the themes are this year, and really it's been uh, building for several years, cloud. Everything social is running in the cloud now, and more and more, not just public clouds, but uh, federations of public and private clouds. Um, it's, it's all about cognitive computing, which is a relatively new term in the sense that it's achieved a, a certain amount of vogue in the last year or so, which is really fundamentally, it's an evolutionary trend. It's basically AI for the 21st century, but leveraging unstructured 
data and um, and machine learning and so forth, and predictive analytics and uh, you know. Well, all the whole that. world learned what metadata was with the yeah. whole NSA. Uh, yeah. Uh, comments. No, it's like streaming. And then uh, just to wrap it up, um, uh, in memory, real time, blue acceleration. You know, you need real time. You need streaming. You need collaboration and social. You know, peer to peer, user generated content. All of that to make this world, new world culture uh, really uh, take off. And IBM provides all of that. We recognize that that's where the world's going. We've been orienting, reorienting all of our solutions around these models, cloud social, um, increasingly going forward. And you know, we provide solutions that enable our customers in all industries to go there, and big data is fundamental to all of that. As we say, where computer science meets social science, that's always been Silicon Angle's kind of masthead view. Yeah. But to unpack what you just said from the market relevance, uh, you mentioned Netflix, we saw Amazon coming out their own uh, movie, they're going to go direct with their own <laughs> programming. So, so that, that speaks to the direct business model of, the web was originally pioneered as, hey, a direct business model, cut the middleman out, but now yeah. that dimension has been explored. So that, kind of what you're saying there. So that's cool. The end user piece is interesting, you mentioned social. So what's your take on the end user uh, orientation? What's the expectation? Because you got social, you got at rest, you got in motion, you got learning machines providing great recommendations, you got the Watson kind of yeah. you know, reasoning for people. So personalization, recommendation engines, the sea change, attention, time, currency, big data, <laughs> all those buzzwords. Oh, yeah. What is the expectation for users in the future? Right now we're moving into this new world where, hey, I can self-serve myself, monologue-based uh, yeah. information from the web. Now it's all coming at everyone in real time. The alarms are going off, as Jeff Jonas says. What is that preferred user experience? The direct business model, people get that. I think the businesses see that. But now the end users are now at the center of the value proposition. Mm -hmm. How do, what's, what's the role of the user now? They're, per, they're participating in the media. They're also consumers of the media. Yeah and they now have different devices, so what's and the... And they're sources of data. So fundamentally, yeah, the role of the, what the consumer's expectation now is, always, everything's always on, everything is always online, everything is all digital, everything is all real time and streaming, everything is all self-service, everything is all available in the palm of my hand, um, and then the back-end infrastructure, the cross-channel infrastructure, you know, users don't care about individual socials, they really don't, they don't really fundamentally care about Facebook, or, or Twitter, or whatever you have. They just care that what their experience is seamless as they, they move from one channel to another. They're not perceived as channels anymore. They're simply perceived as places or communities that overlap to in a, in a, in a dizzying array of socials. Thus social is where we all live, and thus social increasingly is mobile. Increasingly mobile is, you know, it has, the user expects that the handoff from my smartphone to my tablet to my laptop to my uh, digital TV set and, and so forth, that it all happens through the magic of infrastructure, that it's being taken care of and they don't have to worry about that handoff. It all, it's all part of one seamless experience. Yeah, you know, they always used to say in the search business, it's the it's the it's the intersection of contextual and behavioral. Yeah. And now you take that online, behavior is community. Contextual is context yeah. to what people are interested in, at any given time. Yeah. <laughs> so many long tail distributions at any given time. So, do you see uh, the 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 new media companies, the, the 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 new brands that might emerge? I mean, there's all the talk about Marissa Mayer kind of turning over Yahoo, and yeah. you know, she some say putting lipstick on a pig, but but uh, <laughs> um, but is that they're just an old older brand trying to be cool? But yeah, is, that what, is that what users want? You're talking is, about is big that, media before, Big media, right? just user experience. Yeah. I mean, we're, yeah. like, we're small media, but we got big ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing is the outcomes, right? I'm a the, small fry in big blue, so <laughs> go figure. Are the outcomes still the same? Say, companies still want to drive sales for their business, sell yes. a product, provide great value. Users want to find great content mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. find people. I mean, the same concept of, of the old web, search, find yeah, content, sure. consume it. Um, <laughs> Do you have any vision on how that environment will evolve for a user? Like, is it going to be pushed at me? Do you see it, uh, a new portal developing? Is, I mean, Facebook's kind of a walled garden, but don't care about that. What's your take on that? The, the, the future vision of a user experience online. User experience online, future vision. <clears throat> um, in many ways, um, I, I think, let's, let's talk about Internet of Things, because that keeps coming more and more into the discussion. It's, it's not so much that yeah, the user wants a seamless experience across channel, cross device, all that. But a big part of that experience is the user 
knows that increasingly they'll have some confidence that whatever environments, physical environments they're in, are being, they're, they're, obviously there's privacy implications and surveillance here, are being monitored and tracked and optimized to meet their requirements to some degree. In other words, environmental monitoring, Internet of Things, in your smart home, you want to configure this in your smart home so that every room that you walk into is, as, you, as you're moving there, even before you get there, has already been optimized to your needs. That ideally, there should be prediction. Oh, Jim's walking into the bathroom, so turn the light on and, and also start to heat up the water because it's 10 o'clock at night. Jim usually takes his bath around this time. You sort of want that experience to be handled by the Internet of Things. Like Nest, these new tools like Nest. And, yeah, and yeah. So essentially then, it's the, my user experience is not just me interacting with devices, but me simply moving through environments that are continuously optimized to my needs and needs of my family. You know, the, the whole notion of autonomous vehicles. Your vehicle, if it's your personal vehicle, then you want to always uh, uh, optimize the experience in terms of like, you know, um, the, the heat setting and, um, and the entertainment se uh, uh, adjustments on the, you know, the media center in there. Always to be tailored to your specific needs at any point in time. But also, let's say you take a zip car, you rent a zip car, and you've got an ID with uh, that company or any of the other companies that provide those on-demand rental car services. Ideally, in this uh, scenario, that whatever vehicle you, you rent through them for a few hours or so, when you enter it, it becomes your vehicle. It's completely customized to your needs because you're a loyal customer of that firm and they've got your profile information. This is just a hypothetical. I'm not speaking to anything that I actually know about what they're doing. But fundamentally, you know, ideally any, any on-demand vehicle or conveyance or other item that you, you lease in this new e economy is personalized to your needs while you're using it and then as it were depersonalized when you, you check it back in so the next person can have it personalized to their use as long as they need it. That's the vision of a big part of the, the vision of customer experience management. Personalization not just of your personal devices but personalization of almost any device or environment in which you are operating. So if I ask one question, I know Dave wants this question. No, ahead, I, want, I want to ask one more question on, sure. that, on the user experience. came on Twitter from uh, uh, Big Data Alex uh, says while you're on the subject with James. Hi, Alex, I know who he is. <laughs> uh, great, great friend of the Cube. Uh, thanks for the tweet. Uh, too bad we don't have our crowd chat open. Um, we can get the chat going there. But um, why not talk about AR and uh, augmented reality? I mean, obviously, Internet of Things is now not the palm of your hand. It could be on your wrist or yeah. on your clothing. The wearables and on all that. The, on the glasses. And just gave out three invites to Google Glass. Um, so this is, again, another addition, augmented reality. It's a software paradigm as well. What, is that, what, is it, what does that fit into that? What's your take on uh, augmented reality? On augmented reality? Oh, augmented reality, okay. So augmented reality is, the, which I don't use myself, I've just si simply seen it demonstrated in plenty of places. So augmented reality is all about um, layers of, of additional information overlaid on whatever visual video view or image view that you happen to be carrying with you or have available to you while you're walking around in your normal life. So right now, conceivably, if this is an AR, setting that I would, um, or environment, or enabled device, I would be able to see, for example, that, oh, okay, um, who's in this room, in the sense that, who has declared that they are in this area of uh, Mandalay Bay right now, and why, speci what specifically are they doing to the extent that they allow that information to be seen, and oh, of these people here, which of these people, if any, might be the person I'm going to be speaking with at 430, so that if they happen to be in this environment, I can see that. I can see that they're, uh, to some degree, they may have indicated status, waiting for James Kobielus to get done with the Wikibon people. Oh, that's kind of cool. So I'd see that overlay. And then I walk to other parts of the convention center. I might also see overlays as I walk around, like, oh, there's a course down, uh, several rooms down, that I, I've actually put in my schedule. Uh, it's going to start in about five minutes. I'll just duck into there, because it reminds me through the overlay. That's the whole notion of personalization of the environment in which you're walking around in real time, dynamically and contextual, that in, in alignment with your needs or with your requirements, or in alignment also with these, um, whatever data those environment managers wish to share to anybody who's subscribing in, in that context. So that's, that's context cool. aware, that the theme they've been talking about here, yeah. contextual so aware. So essentially, it's a public space that's personalized to your needs in the sense that you have a personalized view 
the dynamically update. Dave, That's that cool. sounds like CrowdChat. Uh, are we running a crowd chat right no, now? No. Crowd chat's an overlay. Social yeah, space absolutely. is public. It's an overlay and a, social tailored to the a needs. set of social networks. Yeah, absolutely. tailored to the needs of the, of the group. Yep, that, that adds value on top of that data. Yeah. So James, I, I, I got to get your take on something. So we had Merv on yesterday, great <laughs> Merv guest. Merv Adrian, one of my great buds <laughs> from and, and, the analyst days. And he was on last week at uh, Big Data NYC. You know, we did our own little event there, Don, uh, coincident with uh, Hadoop World. So Merv said, well, we're just entering the trough of disillusionment for big data. <laughs> yeah, you got to love those Gartner, you know, oh, uh, communications tools. I mean, they are genius, and I get a lot of credit to him. But he said that's a good thing because it goes left to right. So we're, we're, we're making progress here. Okay, okay, great. But I'm getting nervous. The Internet of Things, I love the concept. We've done, we done work on industrial internet, and, you know, a, a smarter planet you know, yeah. fits in there. Yeah, and I, and so, so I love it, but I'm getting nervous. Here's why. I look back at a lot of the promises that were made in the BI days, mm -hmm. 360 degree of the, of the business, predictive analytics, a lot of the things that yeah. we're now talking about in the sort of Hadoop big data movement yeah. that we're actually fulfilling with this new wave that the old wave really wasn't able to fulfill because it got <laughs> sort of distracted doing Sarbanes-Oxley and reporting and, <laughs> and balanced scorecards. So, <laughs> So I'm nervous. He's old school now. When he re when he references something that was hot in the mid part of the 2000 decade. Okay, go ahead. Okay, we had a guy on today talking about balance score. Well, we, ju <laughs> <laughs> well, we just talked about crowd chat. That's the hottest thing that's in the 2013. First time in like five years, I've heard anybody mention Sarbanes Oxley. So well, it kind of saved that whole business for you. Thank you, Enron. But so at any rate, so, so what, what I'm nervous about is as I've seen a number of waves <laughs> over the years where. Um, the, the vendor community promises a vision, great vision, great marketing, and then all of a sudden something hotter comes along, like Internet of Things, and says, oh no, this is really it. So my question to you is, <laughs> help us, you know, help me in my mind, you know, <laughs> uh, close that ga dissonance gap. Is, is, are these two initiatives, this sort of big data analytics for everybody, putting analytics in the hands of business users, yeah. are, are, is that sort of complementary to the Internet of Things? Is Internet of Things just the new big, trillion dollar market that everybody's going to go after and forget about all those promises about <laughs> analytics everywhere. Help me sure, squint Dave. through that. My job is to clarify confusion. <laughs> um, you know, if you look at the convergence of various, call them paradigms, there's a lot of, par big data analytics is one of them right now. Clearly there's cloud, clearly there's social, clearly there's big data analytics um, and, and mobile, and there's something called internet of things. Um, so some, some talk about smack. SMAC, social mobile analytic, AKA big data cloud. If you add IOT over there, that's smacky it. I don't think it works or smassy it. But fundamentally, if you think about Internet of Things, it's, it's all about machines or automated dev devices of various sorts. Probes and you know, your, your smartphone or whatever, uh, you know, servers, or even you know, the autonomous vehicles. Those are things that do things. And you know, they are, might be sources of data, they, would, they are. They might be consumers of data. Um, they might conceivably even be intermediaries or brokers or routers of data. What I'm getting at is that if you look at big data analytics, I always think of it as a pipeline, all data. It's like data sources and data consumers. And then there's all these databases and other functions that operate between them to move data and analytics and insight from one end to the other of the pipe in a conceptual way. Think of the Internet of Things as, well, a, a new category of sources of data. These devices, whether they be probes or monitors or your smartphones, and new consumers. And they, all those same things are probably going to be, in many of them, consumers of data. And there's message passing among them. And then the data that they pass might be passed in real time through streaming, like InfoSphere streams. It might be cached or stored at various intermediate databases and various analytics performed on them. So think of, you know, I like to think of the internet of persons, places, and things. Persons, that's human endpoints, consumers and, and, and sources of data. That's all of us. That's social. Um, places, that's geospatial. You know, you think about it, the internet of geospatial, you know, geospatial coordinates of, uh, of, of data and analytics. And then there's things. There's, you know, automated endpoints or, you know, hardware, uh, even nano, from macro to nano devices. So there's just a ra new range of sources and, and, uh, and consumers of data and new types of analytics that are performed and, and new functions that can be performed um, and outcomes enabled when you, as it were, stack Internet of Things with social, with cloud, with mobile. New possibilities in terms of optimization in real time it, throughout the, you know, the smarter planet. If you think about the smarter planet vision, it's all about uh, interconnected, instrumented, and intelligent. 
instrumented, you know, I instrumentation that uh, traditionally it suggests hardware instrumentation. That's what probes are. Sensors and actuators, that's the Internet of Things. It's a fundamental infrastructure within smarter planets. I love, love that, thank you for clarifying. Sure. I could write a blog post out of that, and I think I very well may. So, um, now, I want to follow up and, and bring it back to the users. Um, I know Smack. And, and, sorry, go ahead. Smack. I thought you were going to say uh, storage, you don't know Smack. map produce, I... analytics, and query or something. We sell <laughs> Smack on the cube. <laughs> so, so I want to bring it back to the users. So we had a great conversation yesterday. Um, actually, last week, Abhi Mehta was on. I don't know if you know Abhi Mehta. And he said, look, why aren't there any, any you know, where are all the uh, uh, big data apps? He said, well, you need three things to, for big data apps. You, you need domain expertise, you need algorithms, which are free, and you need data scientists. And I'm like, oh. We'll never get there. Are so, algorithms really free? Well, there are open source. That was source. his argument. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he's saying, he's yeah, saying, sure, they're he's open saying source. If, yeah. if people charge him for algorithms, big trouble okay. was his point, I think. Okay, oh, sure. That's so, and then we had a discussion yesterday about how in the early days of the automobile industry, you know, the forecast was this is problematic. The gap to adoption is there just aren't enough chauffeurs. <laughs> so, the, the premise that we were putting forth in the discussion yesterday, I don't know who that was with. Was that with Judith? Or, anyway, it was good was that, look, we've got to figure out a way to get analytics in the hands of the business user. We can't g have to go through a data scientist or yeah, some business yeah. analyst, to, you know, uh, that's not going to work. We'll never get adoption. So what I what's going to bridge that gap? Is it, is it the things you talked about before, all these, you know, cool solutions that you guys are developing? The Project NEO that you announced today, visualization, yeah. is another piece of that. What puts it in the hands of guys like me that I can actually use the data in new and productive ways. Yeah, well self-service business intelligence and visual visualization tools that are embedded in the very experience of, you know, using apps for example on your smartphone. Democratization of, you know, data science down to all of us. You need the right tools, you need you need the tools that the new generation of of people, like my children's generation, just adopt and they work and they're just attuned from from the cradle to working with data and visualizations and creating visual, you know, uh, analytics of various sorts, though they may not perceive it as being analytics. They just may perceive it as working with shapes and patterns. Doing and stuff. Written, yeah, doing <laughs> stuff. Yeah, so playing around you know, in, in a sandbox. I love that terminology. Data scientists work in you know, sandboxes, which is data that's, you know, the they, marts that they build to do regression analysis and segmentation and decision trees and all, you know, all that good stuff. You know, the fact is your sandbox can conceivably be completely on your handheld device. With all the visualizations built in, you're simply doing searches and queries. You know, you're asking natural language questions. You're looking at the responses. You're changing your queries. You're changing your visualizations and so forth to see if anything pops out at you as being significant. Playing around. At, you know, it's a simple matter that, that, that these kinds of tools such as IBM, you know, Cognos, and uh, so forth, enable everybody to become, as it were, a, a data scientist without having to, you know, become a, make that their profession. It's just a, you know, part of the fabric of living in modern society where data surrounds us. People are going to just start playing with data, and they're going to start teaching themselves all these capabilities in the same way that when they invented automobiles, and you know, it wasn't Henry Ford who invented them, it was invented like in the late 1800s by engineers in Europe and America. You know, it's like we didn't all become auto mechanics. Very, you know, there are <laughs> trained auto mechanics, but I think most human beings in the modern world know that there's a thing called an automobile that has an engine that needs gasoline and oil and occasionally needs to be brought to a professional mechanic for a repair and so forth. We have, many of us have a, a rough idea of, the, of something called a carburetor, blah, blah, blah. You know, in the same way that when computers came up after World War II and then and gradually invaded our lives through PCs and everything, we all didn't become computer scientists, but most of us have an idea of what a hard disk is. Most of, it know, most of us know something about something called software and things are called operating systems. In the same way now in this new world, most of us will become big data analytics geeks, practical, to the extent that we'll learn enough of the basic terms of art and the, the relationships among the various components to, to live our lives. And when the stuff breaks down, we call the likes of IBM to come and fix it. Or better yet, they just buy our products and they just work magically all the time without fail. Conversant and comfortable with the concepts to yeah. the point which you can leverage yeah. them. And, and what about visualization? Where does that fit? <laughs> Visualization. 
visualization is where the rubber meets the road of analytics, is it's where human beings, how human beings extract meaning, insight, fundamentally. I mean, it's like, yeah, you extract insight in lots of different ways. You do searches and so forth. But to play around with it, to actually see you know, a heat map or a geospatial map or, um, or, any, you know, or you know, um, a pie chart or whatever, you see things with your eyes that you may not have realized were there. And if you can play around and, and play with different visualizations against the same data set, things will pop out that, you know, the statistical model, just seeing the raw output of a, of a, of a, of a you know, data mining or predictive model or a statistical analysis, those patterns may not suggest themselves in rows of, 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 of numbers that would pop out to an average human being or to a data scientist. They need the visualizations to see things that, you know. Because uh, so in other words, when you think about analytics, it's all about the algorithms that are drilling through the data to find those patterns. But it's also about the visualizations. You need the algorithms and you need the visualizations. And of course, you need the data to really enable human beings of all levels of expertise to find meaning. And fundamentally, visualizations are a lingua franca between non-expert human beings and expert human beings, between data scientists. Visualizations are a lingua franca. Hey, look what I saw. What do you think? You know, that's the whole promise of, uh, of, of tools like Concert, for example, we demonstrated this, this morning. It's a collaborative environment. It's sharing of visualizations and data sets and so forth among business analysts and the normal knowledge worker. You know, within, you know, like, what do you see? Here's what I see. What do you think? No, I don't see that. Um, here's another visualization. What do you see there? Oh, yeah, I, th I think I see what you mean. And here's my annotation of what I, the broader context. That I th you know, here's what I, th oh, this is great. That's the whole notion of humans deriving insight. We derive it in socials. We derive it in teams uh, that some, Dave might be adept at seeing things that Jim is just absolutely blind to. Or you know, Nancy might see things that both of us are blind to. But we're all looking at the same pictures and we're all working with the same data. It's part art. Yeah, it's art. <laughs> so let's talk about some plumbing uh, conversations. Okay. You know, one of the things that we noticed, we were at the Splunk conference this year. Splunk came out of nowhere, taking log files, making them manageable, yeah. saving time for people. Sure. So the, the thing that comes out of the Splunk conversation is that it's just so easy to use. The, their customer testimonials are overwhelmingly positive around the area of, hey, I just dump my data into this the Splunk box and it good, good stuff's happening. I can search it, 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 it gives me insight, saves yeah. me time. So that's the kind of ease of use. So, so how does IBM get into that scenario? Because you guys have some good products. We've got, um, um, on the platform side, mm -hmm. but you also have some older products, Legacy, or Lotus, other environments, yeah. collaborative software, that's all coming together and converging. So how do we get to that environment where it's just that easy, just dump your data in and let it do its magic? What's, yeah, what's create, the, load, and go. That's the very proposition um, that we provide with our pure systems, uh, pure data systems portfolio. Pure data systems for And big insights, right? Pure data right? system for Hadoop and so forth. In fact, big insights, you know we have um, an appliance now. Yeah. So we have PDH. So that's the whole create, load, and go scenario that, of course, Bob Picciano and Les Retchen and others um, demonstrated on the main stage mm -hmm. uh, yesterday and today. So we, <laughs> you know, we do that, and we are yeah. simple and straight and easy to use and so forth. That's our value prop. That's the whole value prop of an appliance. You know, simple. Uh, you don't need a ton of expertise. We pre-build all the expert in a, uh, expertise patterns that you can d use to derive quick value from this deployment. Um, we provide industry solution accelerators for machine data analytics on top of big insights to do the kinds of things you're talking about with Splunk's offerings. Um, so fundamentally, you know, that scenario, we all, we, and we're, you know, we have many fine competitors, we offer that capability. Now in terms of the broader context you're describing, we're a well-established provider of solutions. We go back more than 100 years. We have many different product portfolios. We have lots and lots of customers who have invested in IBM for a long time. They might have our older products and our newer products in various combinations. We support the older generations. We strive to migrate our customers to the newer releases when they're ready. We don't force them to migrate, so we make very, we're very careful in our roadmaps to provide them with a migration path and to make it 
worth their yeah. while to upgrade when the time comes to the newer features. Okay, so I got to now change gears to the to the the shiny new toy conversation, okay. which is shiny you know new toy. you know we love that in Silicon Valley. What's a shiny new toy? And there's always in emerging markets when you have sea changes like this, where there's a whole the new whole new wave comes in, creates new wealth, old gets destructed, new takes over, mm. whatever the, that conversation goes. But I got to ask you, okay, relative to the IBM landscape that you that you're over o overlooking with big data and under the, under the under the hood with cloud, et cetera. Yeah. There's always that one thing that kind of breaks out as the leader, the leading toy, the shiny object that that people gravitate to as as a, and I'm honest, I won't say lost leader because you guys, you know, it's not not about giving away free. It's it's the product that goes, wow, we this is the lead horse, you know, in in, in this game, right? So yeah. so what is that? What is the IBM thing right now that you're doubling down on? Uh, is it blue acceleration? Is it insights? Is it all? Uh, point to the few highlights right now that's really cutting through the new the new uh, the new soil of. Yeah, we're developing our own rip-off version of Google Glass, thank you. No, no, um. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, it's always like, I mean, I won't say shiny toy, but there's always that sexy product. Wow, <laughs> I want that. I want, all customers are saying, I want that product. Uh -huh. Which leads more, you know, obviously lift for other products. Mm -hmm. Is there one, is there a few that you can talk about that, that you've noticed? Anecdotally, it doesn't have to be specific data, but just observationally. A shiny toy for the consumer market or for the business market? Business, or? business market. Okay, business market. that's what I was, yeah. yeah okay. Is it Watson, is Watson the, uh, uh, the, the draw is it the what's, what's the headline? You know, I'm looking for the, the lead lead dog here. What's the lead <laughs> tech? There's always one in an emerging market. Well, you could put you on the spot here. Well, you could say that um, the funny thing is the the whole notion of a shiny new toy um, implies something tangible. When the world has gone more and more intangible in the cloud, so we are moving our entire portfolio of big data links, the big data analytics solutions into the cloud, cloud-first development um, going forward are the core principles for the pure data systems portfolio and, and the like. So the shiny, the shiny new thing The new cons could be shiny new concept or a new paradigm? Yeah, but the shiny new thing is the cloud. Um, the cloud is something pervasive, um, and this, the cloud is something that, it, it really, multiple form factors, that's not very sexy, but customers want flexibility you know, they want to acquire the same functionality either as a, a licensed software package or run it on commodity hardware. We offer that for our big data analytics offerings. Or as an appliance of one sort or another that's specialized to particular requirements. Or as a, a SaaS cloud offering. Um, or as um, a capability that they can deploy on a virtualization layer on top of IBM or non-IBM hardware. Or they want the ability to mix and match those various deployment form factors. So in, in many ways, the whole notion of multi-form factor flexibility is the shiny new thing. It's, it's the hybrid model for deployment of these capabilities. Uh, On-prem, in the cloud, combination thereof. That's not terribly sexy, because it's totally, um, it's totally abstract, but it's totally real. Yeah, I mean, uh, demand-wise, people could say, hey, hey, that drives my business. Because when you go to the cloud, I mean, that's where you can really begin to scale seriously beyond the petabytes. The whole notion of big media, it will exist entirely in the cloud. Um, big media, I like to think, is the next sexy thing because streaming is coming into every aspect of human existence where stream computing, a lot of people who focus on big data think of volume as being like big headline. Oh God, we can go to petabytes and exabytes and all that. Yeah, it's important. Some really fixate on variety, all these disparate sources of data, and now we have all the sensor data, um, and that's very important. We have all the social media and everything, all those new sources, that's extremely important. But look at the velocity. Everybody's expecting real-time, instantaneous, continuous streaming in, all, in everything we do, all of our entertainment, all of our education, surveillance, you know, everything is completely streaming. I think ubiquitous streaming to every device and everybody themselves continue to continuing to stream their very lives everywhere all the time is the sexy new thing. Yeah, Dave and I talk about running Big data. Yeah. We coined that term running data what four years ago. Um, so I got to get your I got to get uh, kind of a thought leader. They're watching us and we're watching. We're us. streaming data right now from these uh, these experts. Yeah, see, your guys are streaming. This is big media. So give us some. Well, I want to get your thought leader perspective. Give us some thought leader mojo around um, <laughs> the hashtag data economy. You know, you, you now you're moving yeah. into a conversation with C level folks, and they said, 
James, tell me, what the hell is this data economy thing, <laughs> right? So what is the data economy? In your words, kind of like, I mean, obviously it's a mindset, everything else, what's your take on that? We've been discussing that internally and externally at IBM. We're trying to get our heads around what that means. Uh, here's my take as one IBM or one thought leader. I, by the way, the trick of being a thought leader is just to let your own thoughts lead you where they will. Um, <laughs> they turn around, where are my followers? <laughs> yeah, seriously. I, I, you know, hope, hopefully they won't lead you too far astray where you're out in the wilderness, too, too long. Um, no, it's an important topic. People are talking about it because people are trying to put the definition around data economy. Yeah. Can you actually have a business construct around yeah. data? Here, here's my take on, on the layers of the, the meaning of data economy. It's monetizing your data. The whole notion of monetization of your data. Data becomes a product that you generate internally or that you source from externally, but you repackage it up and then resell it with value add. The whole notion of data monetization and, you know, it implies a marketplace for database products. Um, you know, when I say data, I'm using it in the broader context of it could be streaming media as the kind of yeah. one is a very valuable category of you know data, like you know whatever Hollywood provides. So there's the whole notion of monetizing your data or providing a marketplace for others to monetize their data, and you take a transaction fee from that, or um, it also means, um, in more of a traditional big data or a data warehousing BI sense, it means that you drive superior outcomes for your, your own business from your own data, you know, um, through the usual method of better, decision, you know, better decisions on trustworthy data and the like. So if you look at data monetization in terms of those layers, including the marketplace, including you know, data-driven outcomes, in many ways, the whole notion of a data economy uh, uh, hinges on everybody's realization now that the, the chief resource for betterment of humanity, one of the chief resources going forward for us to get smarter as a species on this planet, is to continue to, to harness the data that we ourselves generate. Um, you know, people talk about data as being the new oil, but oil was there before we ever evolved. But data wasn't there before we, uh, we, we, we landed on Earth or before we evolved. We generate that, so it's our own exhaust. <laughs> it's our <laughs> own exhaust that's actually a renewable resource. Data exhaust from data from exhaust to gold. That's what we yeah. say. Data is the data yeah. exhaust. It's good if you yeah. can harness it and put it together, yeah. uh, as Jeff Jonas says, the puzzle pieces, um, the picture, the big picture, um, <laughs> the smarter picture, the smarter planet. Um, so on the final question, I want to get a wrap up here to our, ne our next guest, but. Uh, What's going on with you these days? Talk about what's up with you. You know, you're very active on Facebook. We give, give a good following. I got a um, birthday coming up. What's, what's happening? You gotta, I'll make sure I say happy birthday for you on your Thank Facebook you page. Um, no, but what's going on in your life? Obviously, you're working at IBM. What are the things that are interesting? What's on your mind these days when you're at leisure? Are you hanging out? Are you think? What are you thinking about the most? What are you doing with your, you know, things with your family? Just share with us what's going on. Well, I hang out at home with my wife and drink beer and uh, listen to music and tweet about it. Everybody knows that stuff. What kind of beer do you drink? Uh, whatever is on sale. <laughs> I'm not going to say where we buy it, but it's a very nice place that, whose initials are TJ. Um, uh, but fundamentally, um, you know, my, my mind is an open book because I evangelize. I put my thoughts, my work thoughts, and well, my personal thoughts out there on socials. I live completely on, well, not completely on socials. I, I self-edit. Um, but fundamentally, <laughs> it, the, 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 the thought leadership I produce, the, the blogs and whatnot I produce all the time, I put them out there for general discussion, and I get a lot of good sort of feedback from the world, and including from inside of IBM, I just try to stretch people's minds. What's going on with me? I'm just enjoying what I'm doing for a living. Now, people say, well, Jim, you're with IBM. Aren't you an analyst? Uh, I'm still doing very analyst-style work in, in a vendor context. I'm a thought leader. I was a thought leader as an, oh, I try to be. Being a thought leader is like being a, a humorist. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's a statement of your ambition, not your outcome or your results. Yeah, you, you can write jokes to your blue in the face, but if nobody laughs, then you're not a successful comedian. <sighs> Likewise, I can write thought leadership pieces till I'm blue in the face, but if nobody responds, then I'm not leading my, anybody anywhere. I'm just going around in circles. And so my, my, my ambition on every single day is to say at least one thing that might stretch somebody's box a little bit wider. You know, yeah, there and I think the, I think IBM is smart. They've been in social for a while. The content marketing is about you know marketing to individuals yeah. with credibility. So, so I, think, I love analysts. I love yeah. all my buds like like Merv and everybody else. And I'm right. you know sort of a similar cat, but 
you know what, there's a role for ex-analysts inside of solution providers, and we have any number, John Haggerty we have, we have Brian Hill, another ex-forester, right? Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a big industry, but it's a small industry. We have smart people on both sides of the equation, solution provider and influencer. <laughs> you know my line? Um, well, 100 and, people, 99 seats. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I suck up to my superiors at IBM. I suck up to any analyst who says nice things about me and hosts me on their show. And uh, that's uh, what's going on in my life. I'm just a big suck up. Well, we'd like, we'd like to have you in the cube. Looking forward to doing some crowd chats with you, um, our new crowd chat application with you guys. Um, lock you into that immediately. Um, it's a thought leader haven, that, that the crowd chat, as it turns out. Dave, uh, what's your take on, on the analyst role at IBM? I mean, let's, let's do a little analysis of the an analyst at IBM. What's your take on, well, this, I think it's, on the situation? It, I, I think that um, the role that, they, that IBM's put James in is precisely the way in which corporations, vendors should use former analysts. They should give you a wide latitude, a, you know, a platform, and, and not try to filter you. You know, and you're, you're good like that, and so. Guess what, I, I do the usual marketing stuff too, the traditional, but I do the new generation of thought leadership marketing, and there's a role for both of those. Yeah, to me, marketing, I've said this, if I said it once, I said it a hundred times, marketing should be a source of value to people, and it's so easy to make marketing a source of value by writing great content or producing great content. So, yeah, that's I mean, my take on it, John. I mean, you're, you're. Marketing is you know, a great this, explainer. You explain the value to the market, and thereby, hopefully, for your company, generate demand, hopefully, in the direction of, your, co your customers buying your things. But that's what analysts and influencers should be, explainers, it's, you know. Well, I mean, Dave, I mean, as influencers, as influencers that we are uh, with, the, with the queue here, but here's my take on it. <laughs> when you have social media of direct, full transparency, there's no, you can't head fake anyone anymore. That whole, those <laughs> days are gone. So analysts, <laughs> bloggers, people who are head faking, journalists, head faking the audience, the audiences will find out everything. Um, so to me, it's like, it's the metaphor of when someone knocks on your door at your house, and you open it up and they want to sell you something. <laughs> you shut the door in their face. When you come in there and they say, hey, I want to hang out, I got, you know, I got some free beer and a big screen TV, you want to watch some football, maybe you invite them into the living room. So the idea of communities and direct marketing is about when you let them into your living room. Yeah. You're not selling, right? You are creating value. I'll tell you what, what I do, I drop um, smart, I try to drop smart ideas into every conversational context throughout socials and also at events like IOD. So, you know, a big part of what I do as a thought leadership marketer is not just write, you know, your clever blogs and all that, but I simply participate in all the relevant conversations where I want, I want ideas to be introduced and oh, by the way, I definitely want people to be aware that I am an IBM employee and my company is, provides really good products and services and so forth. You know, that's really a, a, a chief a role of an evangelist in a high tech uh, Solution yeah. provider. That's one of the reasons why we started CrowdChat, because yeah. you know, the hashtags can get so difficult to go deep into, so yeah. we created CrowdChat. Let's go yeah. deeper and have a conversation yeah. and add some value to it. Yeah. It's, 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 it's you know, think about earned media, as a, as a yeah. term that's been kicked around, but in communities, mm. the endorsement of trust, earning a position, whether you work at IBM, people don't care, hey, he works at IBM or whatever. If you're creating value and you maybe yeah. have some free beer, you get an entry, but you win <laughs> on your own merits. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, the content is the own merits, and I think that's the open source paradigm that uh, is hitting the content business, which yeah. is community marketing. If, if you're a pain in the ass, they're gonna, you're going to get bounced out, <laughs> right, uh, out of the community, <laughs> or if you're selling something, you're gone. So, yeah. um, you guys do a great job. Thank really you very admire. Much. You guys are uh, awesome. You, thank you, you James. Um, I really love what you add to the IOD experience here with this corner here and all the interviews. It's great, great material. Well, thanks for having us here. We really yeah. appreciate thank it. You yeah, for we learned me. a lot. It's been great. You guys are great to work with. Very professional, and the products got great. Great looking, looking portfolio. You're hitting all, hitting all the buttons there. So hitting all the cool. check boxes. So this is theCUBE, we'll be right back with our last interview coming up shortly with Jeff Jonas. He's got some surprises for us. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll see what he brings, brings to his A game. Apparently he told me last night he's bringing his A game to that the, the CUBE. So smart. I'm a huge <laughs> Jeff Jonas fan. He's a rock star <laughs> to me. We love him on theCUBE, he's a tech athlete like yourself. <laughs> we'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.